that video that uh, we played at the beginning of service, that was something that Stephen requested um, to be played. And in light of the, the song that Delonda just has sang, sang for us here this morning, um, I'm not going to be presenting the sermon that I've prepared for you, which will be the first time in seven years. As you know, I'm a pastor of order, of structure. I think there should be order and structure to our service. I plan uh, to, to prepare you a sermon each and every Sunday. And I'm a pastor of order because we serve a God of order. And I think there should be order in a church service. This last Tuesday, we were at the Truth Project here on uh, Tuesday night, and uh, we were learning about the sociology of man. And we learned uh, that during creation, after God uh, each day created, he said, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. And after he created Adam, he said, and it was not good. And we learned that the Lord said it was not good because for the first time in all of eternity, loneliness existed in the universe. Something was wrong, and the Lord knew it. See, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit had been in communion for all of eternity. And when the, when the Lord created Adam, man was alone. And it was not good. So the Lord created Eve. As we got into the new building over the last few months, each Sunday I come in and I think to myself, I leave and I, I think, this is good. This is good. This is good. And then last week I left and I said, this is not good. And this week I couldn't put my, my hand on it. I thought maybe it was me. I was having a bad day or a bad week. Uh, as you know, I've got my own problems, then I carry all of y'all's problems. I thought, well, maybe that's it. But that wasn't it, and uh, the Lord just wouldn't let it go this week and wouldn't let it go last night as I slept. And I think the problem lies with our worship this morning, church. Our worship. See, I don't want us to go down the path that so many churches go down where they come in on Sunday and everything becomes ritualistic. We go through the same motions, we sit in the same seats, we carry the same attitude. I don't want us to be like the Pharisees who think they are mightier and holier than, than all. We're all sinners this morning. But I wonder why we have gathered here today. Why are you here today? Are you here for the pancakes? The fellowship? All good things, don't get me wrong. Are you here because the person that you come with, you know that's the desire of their heart, you're here out of obligation today? Or are you here to worship? To worship. You're going to have to give me time to develop my thoughts today and turn to Scripture. <clears throat> but I want to start this morning in John chapter 4, if you'll turn to your Bibles. John chapter 4. And I want us to talk about worship this morning like God did in creation. We're going to, we're going to put a pause on the sermon series here this morning. And you're probably going to be just as uncomfortable as I am with no notes in front of me. But I'm just going to speak from my heart this morning to make sure we're healthy as a church and to make sure our, our worship is healthy, to make sure we're here for the right reason. The scripture that the Lord has laid on my heart this morning is John chapter 4, Beginning in verse 23. This is Jesus speaking. 
He says, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers, the real worshipers, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seek as such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. In order for true worship to take place here in this building this morning, and in order for true worship to take place in, in your life, you must be worshiping today in spirit and in truth. That's what God is seeking from us here this morning, seeking from each individual here today. That we worship in spirit and in truth. But, but what does that mean here? Well, let's talk about worshiping in, in truth for just a few moments. Each Sunday, we try to prepare truth for you for service. I spend the entire week looking at God's truth and, and trying to present it to you each and every Sunday. Stephen, as your worship pastor, does the same thing and tries to present to you truth through song. We are wanting you to worship in truth whether it be me proclaiming it through preaching of God's Word or uh, through, through Stephen leading us through singing and through you joining in, that we worship in truth. We must be anchored in truth. As many of you know, that is one of our core values here at the church, truth. We must stay anchored in truth in all aspects of our journey. But is it more this morning than just hearing the truth and, and listening to the truth, singing the truth? Is worshiping in truth more than, than just that? And I'm here to tell you that it does involve more than that. It involves you to practice the truth during your life, during your daily life. If you're not practicing God's truth Monday through Saturday, you can't come in here and worship in truth on Sunday mornings. It can't happen. we got so many people within the church living hypocritical lifestyles where they come in and they think that uh, all they owe God is Sunday mornings for an hour. And it's so much more than that. And to come in here and to worship in truth in regards to what God is seeking from us, we must be practicing the truth in our everyday lives. I ask that you turn over to 1 John chapter 1 towards the end of your Bibles. It's right before the book of Revelation. And I want you to hear what the Apostle Paul says, or the Apostle John says, here in this book. He says in 1 John chapter 1 and in verse 5, This then is the message which we have heard of Him. John says, this is the message that we, we've heard of Jesus Christ. And we declared unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If you don't live your life in accordance to, to God's Word or at least strive for it, you're lying to yourself and you're not practicing the truth and therefore you can never worship in truth on Sunday morning. You've got to be practicing the truth. John reiterates the same thing over in John chapter 2. If you'll go down to verse 3. He says, and hereby we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. How do you know that you know Christ this morning? You keep God's commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Truth is important this morning. We must be practicing the truth so that we can come in here on Sunday and, and worship in truth. Some of you won't even hardly move your mouths on Sunday, much less worship in truth. Don't worry about what everybody else thinks. The only person you need to be worrying about is what God thinks this morning. So in order to, to come in here and worship on, in truth, we've got to be in the truth, listening to the truth, digesting the truth, but we also have to be living the truth out. 
Those are the real worshipers. That is who God is seeking. Well, what about in the spirit? What is, what is John saying when he says we must worship in spirit here this morning? Well, I think a number of things must happen if we're going to worship from the heart here today. And that's what God is seeking. He's seeking for us to worship from the heart. And one of the things that must be addressed in order for you to come in here and worship in the Spirit is that your sin must be addressed. And we all have it. We all have sin in our lives. That sin blocks that connection, that relationship with God Almighty. And it's got to be resolved. If you are living a sinful lifestyle this morning, there's no way you can come in here and worship in spirit and truth. There's no way you can worship the way God would have you to worship today. We're told in 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. You're calling God a liar this morning if you say you haven't sinned. And his word is not in us. The truth is not in us. We have all sinned this morning and fallen short of the glory of God. And we should humble ourselves before we approach the throne of grace, before we, before we kneel our hearts in worship. And not only must we confess our sin to the Lord, but I think we're to confess it to one another. And I know that's a difficult thing. But as a a body of believers, as family here today, we should be able to confess our sins to one another. Many of you are involved in small groups and have developed relationships. You should have someone here within the church that you can be honest with, even when it gets ugly. Even when life gets ugly, that you can say, this is what I'm involved in and this is what I need you praying for me praying about for me we should be confessing to one another our sins and we're told that in the book of James we're told in James chapter 5 verse 16 confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We're to confess our faults to one another, and they're they're daily faults. We all struggle. Don't let this suit fool you this morning. I'm just like you. I struggle on a daily basis. But we need to be confessing our faults to one another so that we can be praying for one another, so that we can be healed, and so that we can come in here and worship in the Spirit. If there's sin in your life, it must be resolved in order to worship in spirit here this morning. Perhaps you're here today and you've offended someone. Well, that too must be addressed just like sin, whether it's intentional or non-intentional today. And if truth be known today, we've probably, every one of us here, have offended someone in our life this week. We live in the United States of the offended we're always offending one another. But before you can come and worship before the throne, before you can worship in spirit and truth, that offense has to be resolved. If you'll turn over to the book of Matthew, Jesus speaks of it in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5. He says in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 23, Jesus says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, if you're going to, to worship in spirit and truth and, and bring the sacrifice of praise to the altar, and there you remember that you have all against your brother, if you have offended a brother or a sister, if you have offended someone in your life, he says, Leave there the gift before the altar. Leave the altar. Leave the altar. Your worship is no good. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. 
Have you offended someone in your life here today? That must be resolved so that you can worship in spirit and in truth today. It must be resolved. Whether it be intentional or unintentional. A lot of times it's unintentional, but we've got to resolve it so that we can worship. So if there's unaddressed sin, you've got to address, you've got to address it. If you've offended someone, you, you've got to address that as well. Uh, thirdly, perhaps you need to forgive someone here today. You've not forgiven someone. Someone's done something to you and it's uh, egregious, it's hurt you, and uh, you've yet to forgive them. Well, I want you to listen to what Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter 18. Turn on over to Matthew chapter 18. I'm trying to show you here today, church, what it takes to worship in spirit and in truth. I'm trying to show you the things that, that must be addressed. We're told in Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. Then cometh Peter to him and said, Lord... How often shall my brother sin against, him, against me, and I forgive him? Seven times? Shall I forgive him seven times? And Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee seven times, but seventy times seven. Four hundred and ninety times. Now, is, is Jesus putting a number on the number of times we need to forgive an individual? No, he's not. He's saying it's countless. You just keep forgiving. You keep forgiving. It doesn't matter what they've done. You just keep forgiving. And then he goes on to say, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king. He said, This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's like a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. This is an infinite amount. Six billion dollars in today's currency is what this man owed. Six billion dollars. It's, it's an amount that's unpayable. And Jesus says, but for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and, and all that they had in payment be, may be made. The servant therefore fell down and, and worshipped him saying, Lord have patience with me and, and I will pay thee all back. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and, and, and loosened him and forgave him his debt. Forgave him all of his debt. But that same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. It would be equivalent to $12,000. And this servant laid hands on him and, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe me. And his fellow servants fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have, patient with me, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay his debt. So when his fellow servants saw that this was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto the Lord all that this servant had done. Then his Lord, after that, he had called him and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave you all your debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Jesus says, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if from your hearts you don't forgive every brother his trespasses. Jesus says this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. In this parable, in this account... Jesus is the king. And each one of us here today have the debt that cannot be repaid. We're the ones that owe $6 billion for the sins that, that we've committed. And God has forgiven us. If we've confessed Him as, as, as Lord and Savior, He has forgiven each and every one of us. He has wiped our debt clean. He's had compassion on us. He's had pity on us. And shouldn't we show the same compassion and pity to our brothers and sisters, to those around us? We've been forgiven so much, but yet we forgive so little. 
we should be fearfully forgiving today. Fearfully forgiving. So that we don't suffer this punishment that Jesus speaks of here in our text. God has forgiven us. We need to forgive one another. And I know it hurts. There's times in our life when we're hurt so bad by people that you think you can't forgive. But I'm here to tell you today that you can. And you may, you may say to yourself, well, well, I'll forgive, but I'll never forget. Well, you've not forgiven. If you're keeping a record of wrongs, a little list that you can bring to someone's attention down the road, you've not forgiven. You've not forgiven. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul speaks of love. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. It takes love to forgive. He says in verse 4, charity or love suffereth long and is kind. Love doesn't envy. Love vaunteth not itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Love seeketh not her own. It is not easily provoked. Love thinketh no evil. Love doesn't keep record of wrongs this morning, church. If you're still keeping the records of wrongs that you've been done in your past, you've not forgiven. We've got to let it go. We've got to forgive our, our brothers and sisters. We've got to forgive those who have hurt us so that we can worship in spirit and truth. So we must address our sin. We must live a life according to truth. We must go to those that we've offended. We must forgive, freely forgive here this morning. Keep no records of wrongs. And as we come in here today and as we worship in spirit and truth, our main focus should be that of celebrating Jesus Christ he is the center of our worship. He is the reason that we have gathered here today. We should be voicing our love for Jesus. He's the one that's brought us all together here today. That is the reason we gather on Sunday mornings, to collectively worship Jesus. Nothing else. To voice our love for Him through prayer, through, through song, through video, through the preaching of God's Word. We should be grateful for what Jesus has done. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. And if we're not here worshiping Jesus, something is terribly wrong. Terribly wrong. If you'll turn to Philippians chapter 3, I think it is. Paul tells us what worship in spirit and truth is revolves around Philippians chapter 3 verse 3 Paul says we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh are you rejoicing in Christ today are you rejoicing over what he's done in your life are you rejoicing today that you have been forgiven all of your sins, that you've been given a home in heaven? We should be rejoicing today, church. And that joy, rejoicing should, should pour out of us through song and celebration on Sunday mornings. We should be worshiping in the Spirit, rejoicing in Christ Jesus. We should be testifying to what Christ has done for us. Our worship should revolve around Jesus Christ. He should be the sole reason really we're here. And not only should we be celebrating Christ today, but we should be celebrating one another. We should be celebrating as a church. And we have a lot to celebrate, don't we, church? With everything that God has done for us over the past year, over the past seven years, we should, we should have a spirit of celebration. And it should just, just keep pouring out of us. 
Celebrating what God has done for us. Celebrating that God has brought us together as a group of individuals to do work for the kingdom of God. We've been given an incredible opportunity here. An an opportunity like no other. Not many individuals get an opportunity to be a part of a new church. I mean, God has ordained each and every one of you to be a part of this, and He'd done it before eternity passed. He had this plan in place for you way back in eternity past to be a part of this. We should be celebrating one another. Celebrating Christ. He is the head of the church. Celebrating one another because we are the body. If you turn over to 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 14. There we're told, we know that we have passed from death unto life. Because we love the brethren. This is how you know that you've passed from death unto life because you love the church. You love fellow believers. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, church. I stand before you and week in and week out, I try to lay my life down for you. It comes a great sacrifice to my family and my loved ones. But I am ready to lay my life down for the church, for your good. For your good. And we should be laying down our lives for one another to make one another's lives better. That's what the church is about. Laying down our lives for one another. I love the church. I've told you before, she can be an ugly thing. The bride of Christ, she's an ugly thing, but I love the church. I love you. I love you. And I'm willing to lay down my life for you. I'm willing to give my life for you. I'm for, for your betterment, for your spiritual growth. And we are to lay down our lives for one another. We are to love one another as a church. If we've sinned against one another, we should, we should go to that brother or sister and, and, and get it worked out. As a church that, that is growing and is, and is this size, we're naturally going to have personalities that clash. But that's okay. We're still family. We're family. If we can't get, get along here and now, how are we going to get along in heaven? If we've offended someone here today, why don't we go to them? If we need to forgive someone, let us forgive. Let us celebrate one another. I I celebrate the church today. I celebrate those silent heroes that are working behind the scenes. I don't know if you've noticed, but you come in here on Sunday, the whole facility is clean. We've got a group of individuals that are in here on Friday nights and Saturdays cleaning this facility so you can experience the best possible experience on Sunday mornings doing the dirty work. And I celebrate them. I thank them for what they're doing. I celebrate our our children ministry leaders who are sacrificing every Sunday not to be fed in here, but to feed your children. To train your children in the ways of God. They're sacrificing. They're laying down their lives for each one of you, parents. For your children. we got a group that does it on Wednesday nights. Laying down their lives for for the children. For the next generation. It's what the church should be doing. I celebrate all these ministries that are taking place. As most of you know, I'm not a creative individual. I'm relying on other people that's got some creativity to, to do all these things that we're doing. And I'm, I celebrate the fact that we're busy as a church, that we're out doing something for the kingdom of God. That it's not about us. I celebrate our praise team who works so hard each week so that you can be fed. I, I celebrate our special singers, all of you that's got gifts and talents, and you all do. But we've got to celebrate one another. Celebrate one another. We're for one another here today, church. This is what it looks like to to worship in spirit and in truth. 
We must celebrate Christ and we must be celebrating one another. And if there are things in your life that are preventing you from, from worshiping in spirit and in truth, I pray this week that you will reconcile it so that we can come in here and, and be about the Lord's business. Jesus says, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship Him. God is seeking true worship this morning. True worship. And I pray that we all get our hearts right, starting with me. Like I mentioned very early on, I don't want us to go down the path that so many churches go down. I refuse to allow it to happen. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. That is the message God would have you to hear this morning. Let us worship in spirit and truth. Let us celebrate Christ. Let us celebrate one another, church. Let us celebrate what God has done, and let us get cleaned up so that we can come in here on Sundays and truly worship, okay? Let me pray. Father God, we come to you today, and Lord, we just want to be on guard. Lord, we just don't want things to become such a routine and so ritualistic, Lord, that we're just doing nothing more than going through the motions, Lord. And, and that's my fear as a pastor, Lord, that we never become a church that's doing that, that, that we never become a church that is complacent and, and think we're fulfilling our duty by just showing up. Lord, help us to, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, every one of us is, is guilty of that, that sin that needs to be addressed. We're all guilty of offending individuals in our life. We're all guilty of not forgiving and, and keeping records of wrong. Lord, convict our hearts this week. And Lord, help us to resolve these issues that we all face. That we all face. From the greatest of us to the least of us. And Lord, let us be a church that consists of, of men and women that are true worshipers, real worshipers, that are worshiping in spirit and in truth. That they're not just giving you lip service on Sunday mornings, but they're giving you life service. And Lord, that, that we just be about your business, that we be about trying to, to glorify you. Lord, help us to get our focus off of ourselves and, and our focus upon you. And Lord, I pray that you protect our church. Lord, we know that decisions are coming and, and Lord, you're doing a great work. You're on the move. But we also know, know Lord, that Satan is, 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 is zeroing in on us. And Lord, I pray that you protect us, Lord. I pray that you will protect our hearts. Lord, I pray that you'll protect me as the leader. And Lord, help us to get our eyes off of ourselves and our eyes upon you. Lord, I thank you for this group of individuals that have gathered here today, Lord, to this group that is so committed to, to your work. And Lord, I just pray that you'll just continue to help us move forward in one accord, not becoming distracted. Lord, let us be like Nehemiah and not come off the wall. Lord, there's a great work taking place, and Lord, we just want to do it with a heart of worship and a heart of joy, and Lord, we just want you to be glorified through it all. Lord, speak to our hearts and convict us, Lord, and humble us and let us swallow pride so that we'll be on our knees, Lord, worshiping you. Lord, as we saw in the video today, this life is short. And what we do in this life affects how we enjoy the next life. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on the prize, Lord, that, that focus, Lord, to, to cross the finish line. And Lord, we just all want to hear those words, well done, thy good and faithful servant. That's what we want to hear, God. Lord, I pray that you'll just continue to use this group of people as your hands and feet. Lord, that we'll make a positive impact on every person that we come into contact with. Lord, church doesn't happen here on Sunday mornings for an hour. It happens in our daily lives. And Lord, I pray that people that we come into contact with can, can see something different about us. And they want to know what it is. And Lord, that we may be able to point them to you, to point them to Jesus, Lord. I pray these things in your name this morning. 
Amen. I'm going to ask that we stand this morning. We're going to have a song of invitation if the 